Happy Monday, family. Welcome back. Thank you once again for joining us on Parent Power Hour podcast. We are trying to uh, just empower you to be able to navigate the school system. Today, we are blessed to have uh, a friend of the program, Mr. Cipollone is back with us. And Mr. O'Ray is joining us today. A little bit more about this distinguished gentleman in, in a little while. Uh, so happy that you're here. Uh, you do see that Tyrone, the face of our franchise, is not here. Please keep him and uh, his family in your prayers. Uh, please join us as he would have you do. Share uh, the, the chat, share the live, I'm sorry. Participate in the chat. Questions, comments are always welcome. Do your watch parties as if he was here. Um, and thank you for joining us. Family, our connection question today, I'm just stuck on this. I know if you've been watching the show, you're like, man, you wouldn't even come up with another question. I'm just stuck on this because we're at such a time of negativity and stress and strife. And, you know, the country seems to be uh, certainly at odds. Um, the, the connection question is, what is a good thing that's happened to you today? It could be today, it could be this past weekend. You know, we haven't seen each other in a while, gentlemen. It could be over spring break. Um, and I'm going to start with Mr. O'Ray. Give us a good thing, blessing, however you want to couch it. I think uh, <laughs> since, you know, today our third quarter grades are due, right? And, you know, we've been following this narrative of how crappy this year is going to be. I read an article in the New York Times about like the lost year or whatever, right? But at a certain point, I don't know whether it was during spring break, but like seeing some of my students today and how well they have done, it's kind of like feast or famine, right? Those who are in, like they're in it to win it. And for those who are struggling, you know, there's something else going on significantly in the, about the, in the background. So, but just knowing that those two things can exist, um, I am very encouraged by the resilience and the determination of my students. And somewhere along the line, along the narrative of, oh, like what is becoming of our students? I find more opportunity and hope thinking about and concentrating on who are my students gonna be when they come back to me? And how do I prepare them for that? That puts me in a good, and I see that all around me. Like who are the do, who are doing the things in this environment with the tools that they have? All right. Thank you, Mr. O'Ray. Always deep and in, in-depth. In um, and uh, thank you for that. That's, I hope, I hope your, uh, your students are listening um, because that's, that's quite a testament to where they are. I hope they're listening, but the student right now, not necessarily who the audience I'm concerned with, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Mr. Cipolo. Uh Thank you for having me again. Um, my good thing, not, not as deep or as relevant to our conversation, but just um, family time. So spending time with my nieces over the weekend and just the warm weather. During the winter, we forgot how much nicer COVID social distancing was when you could just be outside. So good weather. That's all I need. All right, and uh, you know, for me, I think it's a, a combination of both. The weather's been great, gentlemen, and up until I guess last yesterday or or uh, today for sure. But last couple of days, it has been beautiful. And also, you know, to your point, uh, Mr. O'Ray, to to see middle school scholars um, doing well. Uh, they're back in the building today, throughout the city, um, and. How I feel about that is neither here nor there, but the fact that they are back as a matter of course, but they are doing well and resilience is, is a wonderful word. So mm -hmm. I share in that. Family, uh, if you just joined us, we are without the man, face of the franchise, Mr. Tyrone Barnwell, please pray for him uh, and his family. He's not with us today. Uh, we do have two stalwart educators though, as we are focusing on whiteness, in education, whiteness in education. Now that's loaded, I know it sounds like, but this is not something that uh, we are not unfamiliar with uh, in this country. Uh, and 
you know, I was thinking about it as 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 our, our colleagues were talking off offline here off the air. You know, it's a 402 year problem, this racism in, in this country. And someone told me years back that education was the last bastion of civil rights. And at that time, I didn't know what she was talking about, but certainly today uh, it's evident that that person was correct. So we have two educators here. They're gonna talk us through the work they're doing to try to break down these walls of oppression um, that are continuing perpetuating in our school system with some of our teachers uh, that we have teaching and leading um, students, not only in Baltimore City, but throughout the country in mostly black, brown and urban areas. Uh, Mrs. Sipola, we'll, we'll start with you. Just reintroduce yourself. You were fantastic and, and, a, and a fan favorite last time and tell us the work that you're doing and then we'll pass the mic to Mr. O'Ray. Well, thank you. Um, so I am a, in my sixth year teaching in Baltimore City, um, only place I've ever taught, um, high school history teacher. And um, the work I've been engaged in in, the, in this year, mostly because of the lockdowns where I took extra courses or things to fill up kind of my day and schedule. Um, I've been engaged in a few um, anti-racist courses, particularly with the focus of facilitating spaces for teachers to talk to other teachers about race, about their own race, and how their race plays a role in the classroom. Um, and a lot of my focus, um, because of my own racial identity as white, has been on focusing on building these spaces to talk with other white educators to understand our whiteness and how that affects the classroom. Um, so I've done that with some groups in my own building, but also some courses that I've taken uh, to get that training and facilitation. Thank you, Mr. Cipollone. Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, I too, let's see, I am in, this is my seventh year teaching in Baltimore. My sixth year in Baltimore City Public Schools, I taught for a long time before that um, at um, university level and community colleges. Um, I, like having the hard conversations because I think it's the hard conversations that make places better with people who are willing to have those. I was lucky enough to run into some um, very good and like-minded folk um, in the teaching community. That's how I got into TDP. Rebecca was um, one of uh, the first people who I met. Um, through our union, through other organizing um, folks. And it's been a blessing to find that community here. And I want to bring the work that I see outside in the community uh, to the school that I work at, because I think it's a wonderful place. It offers so much opportunity and has so much possibility that I think to really reach that next step, I think it it's incumbent on us to not only model the practices that we want to see, but we have to pioneer it by taking the risks ourselves. Thank you both. And, you know, difficulty um, is in both of your ways. You know, uh, Mr. O'Ray, um, a person of African descent, uh, Mrs. Pallone, you, you identify as white. It's not an easier conversation, you know, for one oh. or the other. Uh, some quick facts. For the family here um, from our esteemed producer, 50% of educators in city schools are white, while I would say the overwhelming majority of students in Baltimore city schools are black or of African descent. Uh, though many teachers develop a racial consciousness through this experience, there hasn't always been a space um, or training to unpack racism in the classroom. Um, thank you, Rebecca, for that. Uh, if you would, uh, Mr. Cipollone, can you share, and I know you did this <laughs> before, but it always, you know, bears repeating. Can you give us a story um, where race was involved that makes you want to do what you're doing, makes you want to take the courses you're taking and reach out and help other white educators? Absolutely. Um, that's a phenomenal question. Um, a story in my school, very similar, I think, happens in many schools, but um, a year or so ago, uh, the Black History Month a lot of the actions and student actions about Black history, um, student action, Black Lives Matter week of action, um, one of the demands is hire more Black teachers. Um, and students put that on a sign and we put signs for all the demands all throughout the building. 
And particularly that sign, high and more black teachers started a, a controversy, like a, n nothing dramatic, but discussions. And just the fact that not everyone was on board or heard the same thing. Um, and a lot of the responses from students, from teachers, white and black, were, oh, but isn't that wrong to white teachers? Or isn't that wrong to Mr. Cipollone? He's a good teacher. Or isn't that racist to purposely hire black teachers? And I think what that shows is just a lack of understanding of the current state we're in, as if what we currently have is just like neutral. Um, so then going on hiring black teachers would be favoring one race over the other, but a lack of acknowledgement of the reality of the systems we're in that 50% of teachers are white in my school way, I would, in a high school I'm in way more than 50%, I would say are white. Um, I've been on multiple grade teams where all the teachers are white um, and all our teachers and all our students are black. So like if we acknowledge that we're not in this neutral zone and we understand the history that got us here, it's not revolutionary to say hire more black teachers. Like we need to, because we're, right now we're actively hiring too many white teachers. But if we don't have the conversation, then a simple call for hiring more black teachers could be, oh, is that reverse racism or the ridiculous kind of ways I could go through. So just needing to better understand where we're at now. Um, I think that really showed where we're at. Absolutely. Mr. O'Reilly, before, before I come to you, you know, I forgot, Mr. Cipollone, you, you and I share this love for history. Br briefly, why is it important to understand the precedence of history? I think a lot of people look at this moment in time in a bubble. If you look at it in a bubble, you won't get the context. Can you elaborate a little bit? Absolutely. I, I think particularly when we talk about race, it's interesting that we all like go to, oh, well, I was raised to think of this. So my parents always said this. So this is what I, my experience says. But like a real understanding of race, like race has a historical precedent. Like you, you said to lead the show, like 400 years, there was something 400 years ago where Europeans decided to invent race to justify power, right? To justify slavery and domination. It didn't exist beforehand. It's a power construct, right? Um, if we don't understand that history, how can we have a conversation about race, right? Um, so it's not a matter of opinion or what you were raised to believe. Like these are real social dynamics that we could be tied to policy and force. Um, so yeah, I mean, we can't understand where we're at without understanding how we got here. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Mr. O'Ray, uh, care to share a story? I know you. I know you have a few. Can you can you give us one that was on you? You're on mute, Mr. O'Ray. You're muted. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to share the most productive one, um, but it's one that is very poignant. And I think maybe not too many, well, yeah. So I think in the situation that in the context you describe where you have um, a misrepresentation or like a, uh, an imbalance between um, the race of the teachers in the classroom and the populations of the students, um, you can see how that in and of itself, it, it both um, creates a lot of cultural misunderstanding and a lot of tension where, you know, I'm, I'm into um, restorative practices, not, and these kinds of cultural crisscrosses is kind of like trying to meet each other where they're at, where each other are at is, is kind of difficult when you have these, um, um, the baggage that we bring with us, okay? And it always, you know, I feel that we have to listen more to what parents are saying about what is going on in the classroom with their kids. Um, I'm trying to empower students to say more about the about um, you know trying to take the lead on how to deal with issues of race in the classroom. But this is a story that really kicked it up for me to do this work and to break the ice in terms of like each and every one of us, like the all of us taking responsibility for what goes on in our school. There was a colleague, a former colleague of mine who I really, really thought was good for our school. Um, I'm not gonna, um, 
person of color, very, very intelligent. Right? And when that person left, I was very disappointed. But I was even more disappointed to learn the reasons. Right? And that person had told me um, that the reason why they were leaving was not because of the normal things, oh, the school is, well, whatever, and, um, you know, relationships between, not, not the normal tensions, right? It was because they were disappointed. I think that person used the word aghast at some of the ways that some of the teachers treated the students. And unfortunately, um, I saw some of the things firsthand of what that person was talking about. And in that year, uh, this was before the pandemic, um, I knew that it was something to work. I, I kind of saw it all in one kind of like ball that needed to be tackled. And it starts with, hey, we have to, we all have to look at ourselves here and at least acknowledge. And it's not about blame, it's just about acknowledging that, they, that these things do go on in our camp as well, and that we all should be stewards to be able to facilitate conversations around it. That's why I'm here. Wow, nuggets, nuggets, nuggets. And speaking of nuggets, I want to uh, shout out Yaja. Thank you for joining us. And Michael, the faithful. And uh, I don't know exactly, you said you always say a lot, uh, Mrs. Sipalone, but you got nuggets from Yaja for what you said earlier. Uh, and Mr. O'Ray, you got nuggets from me. Um, Mr. Uh, O'Ray, I'm gonna stick with you before I go to Mrs. Cipollone. Same question I'm gonna ask of you, Mrs. Cipollone, but Mr. O'Ray, why is this a hard conversation? It's a 400 year old situation. Um, we, we are more diverse as a nation than ever. Uh, you know, yeah, we can go on the name. Right, right, yes. And we can go on and name, you know, all of the advancements uh, that came out of the civil rights era. Why is it still a hard conversation to have, Mr. Oway, when we're talking about race in the classroom and, and especially when we're talking about teachers, white teachers and race in the classroom? Um, well, I think, um, I don't think it's just about white teachers, okay? I think that we all have our growing to do when it comes to race work, like recognizing um, where people are at. But I think it's just really, when I say that, I think it's true of every of everyone is that nobody really wants to believe that they're prob that part of the problem. Now, I think that's, that's it. You know, I've had a couple of things brought to my attention. You know, like every time I, um, uh, I miss a pronoun, you know, or, you know, I meet someone from, you know, like uh, a different ethnicity that I do not recognize. And then I feel some of the ways that maybe some people feel when they meet me, you know, I think that was a, a an incredible growing experience, but, you know, I'm, I'm willing to be open to that. I'm willing to have that affect me and to have me reflect. I don't think that's true. I think that's, I think that's the issue. All right, thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Right. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think it's it's hard to talk to because it's like by design meant to be not talked about, and that's part of what keeps racism thriving and perpetuating. Um, but I think we are wrong when we think racism comes from ignorance or misunderstandings between different cultural groups. Um, it's a very like systemic built structure. Um, and particularly for white folks, particularly in the like post 1960s, post civil rights era, racism became way more colorblind in name and way more subtle, like war on drugs, war on crime, uh, war on poverty. Um, and as a white person growing up in an all white town, right? What I was very much explicitly taught was like, don't judge people by the color of their skin, right? Pulling like the one MLK quote and don't talk about race, like just don't talk about it. Um, and when we don't talk about it, and when I act like I don't see someone's race, that only benefits the status quo. Um, 
but very much that's being taught in white homes is like the ideal of like, don't, don't see, don't judge someone by the color of their skin. Don't see race. And that's impossible, but we're like literally taught to not talk about it. Uh, so we're very awkward in talking about it now. Thank you both. Um, uh, looks like we don't have any questions or comments yet. Ms. Oray, I'll ask you this scenario. Uh, let's say there's been a race conflict in school. Anger, defensiveness, and embarrassment come up for a white educator. Why does this happen? And what is a healthy alternative? Sorry, can you, I missed the first part of the question. Can you repeat it? Sure. Uh, let's say there's been a race conflict in the school. Anger, defensiveness, and embarrassment come up for a white educator. Mm. Why does this happen? And what is a healthy alternative? <laughs> uh, um, that's the thing. I I don't know if there's an all like an alternative to that. If something embarrassing happens, I think it's more about like, how do you deal with that? Because it's happened to all of us. Not, um, you know, when I mentioned, you know, times like this, like, you know, when um, people get caught out and it's like, whoa, you know, the alternative is, you know, not to have it happen, but once it does happen, you really can't let. And I think that what's important here is, um, you know why I'm here. I feel that I am here on this show today, particularly to model how these hard conversations can be had um, to start that work. When you, if you're willing to say that one, I found myself in these embarrassing situations like, and I have these awkward, these awkward moments right? where it's sometimes it seems better not to say anything, but then you think, ah, oh, I can't let this slide. And then that's where the tools come in or the lack of tools kind of mess up the situation. Instead of looking for, how about the alternative is dealing with it as it is and dealing with it honestly, not Be dealing with it authentically. I think that, cause we're all human. But when we run away from these things and don't address them, that's when they fester into something deeper. Mr. O'Reilly, I, I got to follow up because I was just talking to um, our, our esteemed producer about that very word human and humanity. And why is that? If, if, if we could think about everyone being a human being, there wouldn't need to be this division in race. And I'm not talking about colorblindness, mm -hmm. but if you can see someone being hurt, destroyed, uplifted just because of their race, you know, you should be able to make it, well, you know, how, what does my humanness allow me to do when I see someone who is being hurt? because they are, you know, of another race. You know, something, something should touch me as a human being to say, it doesn't matter what color they are, they're being hurt, they're being destroyed or they're being picked on or they're being maligned. So since you use that, and I, I had just spoken to her about this, mm -hmm. can, you, can you go further with that? The, the, the human level, the human aspect of these conversations. Yeah, because, um... This is what I witness when I'm trying to navigate these conversations, right? I'm trying to be, you know, if I, if I seem very uh, pensive and careful with my words, it's because I am, right? Because I don't want to um, start from scratch again, right? To have it, have the conversations devolve into um, about somebody else or about the messenger. Like, I want to take all of that off the table so that we have nothing left but to deal with what's in front of us. Right? And I really think that, you know, the humanity of it. Okay. And I think that's probably the biggest thing to recognize because when you see um, 
you know, uh, uh, an ad for a show, um, white teachers in education, man, you know what's going, you know what I mean? It's just like, get the tomatoes out and, you know, all that. And that just makes it difficult, you know? Not to say that there aren't some, you know, some, um, some pretty wild things that go on, not in that realm, but we have to realize that if we are going to be successful at this work, we have to treat each other at the human level and realize we all make mistakes and that we all have room to grow. But all that said, you know, we have got to be real. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Simpelon, before I go to you, I uh, want to acknowledge Ms. Shakita Gaines from Philadelphia. Thank you so much for joining us, Ms. Gaines. Um, we appreciate any comments and questions you may have for our panel today. Yaja Pranier says, I think every time we, and by that she means black folks, try to talk about race, other folks act like we are trying to ask for something for free. Thank you, Ms. Yaja. Nuggets for you, Ms. Yaja, as always, uh, something compelling and wise um, to say and offer and contribute. Uh, Mr. Cipollone, I think you've had the situation before where you've had to do some counseling and and, and to, and to uh, some de-escalation where there has been some kind of a race issue, racial issue conflict, and there is anger, defensiveness, embarrassment for the white teacher. What are your thoughts on, on why that happens and what's, how have you helped navigate the situation? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'll lead with like, this has happened to me, right? As the teacher being the abuser or the uh, salient in the, in the situation, right? And it's important to like own that. I think one of the problems is white people have tend to be built this idea that like racist people are bad right? Like racist people are like bad white people. I'm not one of them. I'm good. I'm like a good, bad binary. Um, instead of just understanding that like I'm white, raised in a country that was largely founded on white supremacy in a society that's still dominated by whiteness and white culture. So it's not like I'm spending my whole life proving I'm not a racist. It's that I understand my whiteness and my lack of understanding of the black experience and my huge blind spots are going to come up, especially in a context as fraught with power and racial dynamics like a classroom. Um, so if I just like understand that to my core that like, of course my whiteness, my maleness, my cisgenderness is going to rear its head and leverage and access for power. It's my job then to like hear when someone is brave enough and courageous enough to tell me reflect and listen. Um, it's not my job to then argue and debate why I'm not a racist. Um, and I think in terms of the alternative, it's hard, but the real answer is like, it's wild that in this society, we could become teachers with a master's degree and never really once ever take a critical race theory class or really any real training for teachers on racial power dynamics maybe a diversity class one semester that's like really light hearted right but the fact that we're putting out teachers and all different professions without any real learning like as a white person you could live in america your whole life and never really learn about race um and i think that's the problem so like the alternative would be white folks working with other white folks to like move us in a space away from trying to debate that I'm not a racist because if I accept that I'm some horrible person instead like of course I I'm wrong here how could I not be uh let me listen learn they're trying to give me advice so I could better myself and and grow off of that thank you gentlemen um keep uh sharing the live folks please keep on with the questions and comments we have two fine people here who are trying to break down these walls uh, that seem impenetrable uh, oftentimes when we deal with race in the classroom and whiteness in education. Um, the next question, Mr. O'Ray, for you is, um, sometimes you hear that people need safety to have these conversations. What does this really mean? You spoke about it not long ago about you being very, very careful with your wording. 
-hmm. so that nothing that you could say in trying to help the situation is misconstrued. Yes. Um, I understand. I guess one of my questions is uh, like define is safety. Like I think how one defines safety is kind of key here. Like, does that mean safety means like not um, feeling threatened or feeling criticized or embarrassed? Uh, because that's not, um, if you think about, or um, comfortable is another word that comes up. Uh, people always uh, want to demand like comfort. I think that's one of the things, one of the tenets of uh, culturally responsive, you know, pedagogy is that if we're going to learn from this, we have to accept those moments where we're going to be uncomfortable. You know, um, let us speak about Black lives in a way that makes everyone comfortable. But that's not really what Black Lives Matters is all about. So I think that us not necessarily assume, that's why we have these ground rules to us to ensure that everyone is in a safe place, not just certain people, uh, that everyone is in a safe place. So it's almost like if you're going to enter, if you know something about this culture, safety is a cultural demand on everyone in the group, not just a privilege that someone gets to, you know, call on to escape certain parts of the conversation. What does that mean? I don't feel safe, but I don't feel indicted. I don't feel, you know, that's, yeah. So I'm not sure I buy safety as a demand, like if you mess up, I'm not gonna kill you, <laughs> right? Um, we may have to talk about something difficult. That's something that I may even learn from, right? But are you willing to go there and so that we are safe together in that journey? Wow, okay. See, this is why, this is why we need Mr. O'Ray doing this work. Um, Okay, let me let me let me put. Are you sure it's not working? <laughs> we we still got to push, man. Even though it, it may not seem it's oh. incremental, I know, I know. But let me but let me say this though: How do you in that space? How do you create? I, I, you mentioned ground rules, and I did want to hear you kind of elaborate on those. But a person is coming to you you're trying to explain where they were in air, for mm -hmm. example. How do you make them feel comfortable enough to, to, to open up to you? So you can, so you okay. can assess the, the issue. Okay, um, try to find an analogy. I too have been there. You do it in private, you do it in confidence, right? You do it authentically. Hey man, I really gotta tell you, you're my guy and all, but that was really, not, but when we say these things, um, we do so only know, uh, if we are prepared to accept the same, if we find ourselves in the same position. Mm. I think that's, that's, um, that's very important. Like I try to, um, integrity is very, I mean, people say these things, right? But I really do mean like, um, in this day and age, if you don't have your word and you don't have your integrity, I mean, there's not a whole lot else to talk about, really, you know? So the people who I care about and close to, like, I want to know that they would do the same for me and not leave me hanging out there and know that if they, if, if they took the time to do it, that they would understand and know that they... Um, that they considered um, my care in doing so. Mm. Thank you. Mr. Cipollone, what about this idea of, uh, of a safe place, a, safety, a safe space um, to be able to talk to my teacher mentor, Matt? Mm -hmm. You know, wh wh how, do you, how, do you, how do you approach that? And, and to Mr. O'Ray's point, without letting people get off the hook. Yeah. It's, I mean, Ms. Ora, you, you nailed it. It's like what we're seeing there is safety is being used as a euphemism for comfort, right? Um, and the stakes are real, right? Like 
white people being uncomfortable, especially racial discomfort, leads to real life consequences for black and brown people. Like we shouldn't diminish that, right? Um, but it is that, it's like that walking in America my entire life, I've always been comf I've always been comfortable, I've always fit in. So once I don't fit in and once I'm not comfortable, I literally do feel unsafe. Um, so how do we, and all of, you know, all the norms of like assume best intentions or intentions versus impact, or even uh, Mr. O'Reilly, like the reality of like, oh, it should be private, but it also has to be immediate. If you come to me a week later and be like, oh, that thing, all of these mean, you have to follow all these rules to talk to me about race. And at the end of it, it's impossible to follow all those rules. Like it's not a coincidence. Um, so how to circumvent that? I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not any, like I'm literally going through this myself, trying to figure out just how to be more receptive to the feedback that I receive and letting people know that I want that feedback because so many black and brown people have given feedback only to get all the consequences on themselves. Um, so I think Mr. O'Reilly is right, like leading, modeling, doing it out loud in public, uh, making it a real norm in a, in a, like a culture norm of like, we give each other feedback. Um, but having to really, I think, start the conversation with the reality of like, it, it's it's freeing to be like, no, it's not that, oh, now you're racist and you're evil. It's freeing that like all white people, whiteness itself is power. Right, like by definition. Uh, so all white people will make these mistakes. All white people will do this. Um, the most liberal, woke, whatever you want to call it, me, myself, like I get in the biggest problems where I have these big blinders because I think I know all this stuff and I can't possibly be racist. And then I step in the hole, right? Um, so it's like many times the liberal white people can be the most frustrating because of that. So like we all have this huge blind spot. Like as men, we all have a huge blind spot based on our um, cisgendered status. Um, so if we just could accept that, then like someone giving me feedback, it's, I'm not getting fired. Like white people aren't getting punished for racism. That's never happened. We could like, there's no real consequence. If we could just get past that, like running away from racism, uh, racist, um, like running away from the name calling of racist, like accept it, it's gonna happen, listen, and then you're fine afterwards. Hey y'all! So y'all have nuggets. Can we? Can I suggest that we keep um, stepping a hole? Because I I love that as a euphemism, like how like we've all stepped in a hole of some sort. Because that's just kind of like you know what I mean. It's just like oh man, how did I get here? I thought I was, but we've all stepped in the hole, baby. I like that. That's true, very true. Yes. Uh, and speaking of nuggets uh, and and uh, euphemisms, there, Yashapreneur nuggets from for Mr. Oray. Hi, uh, Mr. O'Reilly, with your, your last um, bit there. And lots of thumbs on uh, on um, Mr. Cipollone's last point. And that was a while ago, Mr. Cipollone, I'm sorry. Um, so yes, uh, very good, gentlemen. Thank you so much. And we hope that you are enjoying this conversation. I know that I am very much enjoying this conversation from two uh, men who are not afraid to uh, admit their mistakes in order to better themselves and better the teachers that they mentor, and which obviously trickles directly to the scholars. Uh, and that is very empowering. Um, what tools, Mr. Cipollone, uh, have you discovered that you need to be able to better have conversations with white folks about race in schools? What's, what tools, sorry if I botched that, what tools do you need? Uh, to talk about race with white yeah. folks? I mean, it's, I think the number one thing we're dealing with is time and space, um, particularly in a school building. Um, a lot of the work I do with other teachers, it's like voluntary. If you're free Tuesday night at 8 p.m. to 9 p.m., do you want to hop on a call? And just the reality of the profession, the reality of all our lives is it's not, you know, no, not everyone's going to make that commitment. Um, so what does it look like to really build time for it? Because that's what it needs. It needs to be growth. Um, so many times when people join, like, I want to do something anti-racist, they're thinking, I want to go in the community and, like, paint a bench, or I want to go do something. But, like, for white folks, anti-racism is introspection. Like, the work of anti-racism is pushing ourselves. So then what is needed would be time and space to do that. 
uh, with real experts because there are real experts. Like I took a class to be a facilitator and I'm kind of doing it, but there are like real experts in the world that like the district or school foundation or whoever could like really put money behind and really get like experts to come in. Yeah, Professor um, Abraham X. Uh, Kendi comes to mind um, as an expert in anti-racism. Uh, Mr. O'Ray, tools for the trade, sir. You mentioned some. You've been you've been dropping nuggets. You've been dropping breadcrumbs along I've, the way. Uh, I've, been, I've been saving them for quite some time. I've had a lot to get off my chest. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this is good. No, this is good. Like I feel like um, I feel like this needed to be done. And it needed to be done um, outside of my building um, to kind of break through the ice. And I think in terms of tools, um, this is an example, like uh, imagination. You know, I think we have to be a little bit more imaginative about how some of us who are dedicated to this work do this work. A lot of it I found depends inextricably on the relationships that we build with people because how are we even going to even approach that not a sensitive topic like this if you don't know this person and you're trying to broach these topics all it feels like is they're coming for you and then defensiveness and aggression and that that that's then you're dead well that's dead the conversation's dead but if i really get time to get to know someone Right. Then, of course, like any other types of I mean, all communication is based on the relationships that you have with people. Imagination and relationships, relationship building. Thank you, sir. Um, let's see. So Yasha, to Mr. Sipanol's point, she says introspection is important. Um, OK, so what about some Mr. Sipanol, give, give us a scenario if you would, uh, that you you have had to intervene or come in and 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 really help the person understand how they were in air and what to do about it. Absolutely. Um, so I'm thinking. I, I'm honestly not a specific story is coming to mind, um, but I will share um, an experience I, I had myself, um, not strictly in the classroom, but in a teacher setting um, where I use my position in a group to kind of give feedback about a facilitator who I didn't think was doing a good job um, and very much leaning into my own like whiteness and maleness thinking that like I knew how this anti-racist group should go um, where I'm like a participant in it. Um, and then like a week or two later, the, the facilitator hit it net, head on and didn't name me. I didn't think she knew who I was, but hit head on that like someone did this and this is why this is exactly what we're talking about. This is racism, this is whiteness and power. Um, and my initial reaction was like, oh, she doesn't know what I was saying. No, that's not, that's not what I was saying or this. And then I had to sit in and I had to just like rely on my, what I forced myself to do, which is just to like tell myself I am almost 99% likely to be wrong because of who I am coming at this situation. I'm almost definitely seeing it wrong. And once you actually accept that, you actually can listen to someone. Um, and then I heard what she said. I heard exactly what I did. I did exactly what I was trying not to do uh, because I thought I was doing it for good. I exerted my power, thought I knew better and talked behind her back to her supervisor, right? Like I did exactly what I would be shocked to think I would never do. Uh, but what did it take me to like hear it? Um, then come out front and said that was me and apologize for it. Was that like just understanding of like, I'm not in a debate. Don't be devil's advocate. Don't like try to beat them with my point. It's just like, listen, accept that I'm wrong that I'm almost definitely gonna be wrong. Um, and then I was able to grow. Um, so bringing this to another teacher, I would try to do a similar thing, which is like really, you know, there's power being like, I've done the same thing before. I've done this thing similarly. 
And I thought I was right. And I didn't want to be seen as racist, right? But if let's just try listening about like, let's just try to listen and be empathetic. And then uh, once you get past that, like defensiveness, it's not that hard to have conversations and to um, really learn from. Thank you. Uh, Mr. O'Reilly, is this work measurable? If it is measurable, how, how is it measured? It's measured in the discourse of the community, what is allowed and what is confronted. You're just gonna drop the drop the mic just like that, huh, Mr. All right. Well, I mean, I can go into more. I might have been all day. No, I no, like uh, at times. That was beautiful. One of one of one of, one of my um, okay, I'll tell you. One of my things, myself, of many of my self improvement things, you know, uh, I can be uh, I can be long winded at times. So I'm really working on being very succinct. Now I'm getting it the other way. It's like that's all you got. Like I'm trying to be pithy, but um, you know, it's the things that you hear, right? You know, it's 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 kind of like that. That's where you that's where you can tell the culture of the community, right? And the things that are confronted. So. I'm not gonna tell a direct story about where I'm at, but I can tell you a story that happened to me in college that has been, that has, um, that always has informed the way that I approach this work. So I went to the University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign, right? Messed up mascot, but they got rid of it after 10 years of like agitation when I was, I mean, not because of me, but that was where I got my political awakening. And um, this was my freshman year and uh, I had a, uh, a white roommate uh, from Chicago originally. We were both from Chicago, but we come from very different worlds. He went to a very fancy private school. I went to a very good uh, magnet school. And um, we moved in. We lived in the same dorm. We were roommates. And we had talked a little bit because we were from Chicago and stuff like that. And it was kind of cool. I was like, all right, this is, you know, white Jewish kid from Chicago, black kid from South Side. Let's see how this works. That's fine. And um, he had uh, he had a guitar, so he was into like classical guitar, and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. I kind of mess around with it and stuff like that. And I know something about like some classical, you know, music and stuff like that. And we had a conversation, and then he stopped and he said, "Wow, you're really cultured." And I was just like, it was one of those moments, like, uh, like I knew what he meant, but it still felt that way where it's just like, exactly, what did you what did you mean by that? And he must have saw the look on my face, and he was like, "Wait, no, that's not what I meant. You know what I mean? You know what I meant, right?" I was just like, "I know what you meant." But and then we got into this conversation, and like, and this is what this is. Uh, this is nineteen ninety, yeah, nineteen ninety, right? Um, when you know multiculturalism wasn't that far really off the ground yet, it certainly wasn't even that popular, but it was right there, and we actually had a conversation. I and I explained to him how like class and race kind of informs this whole idea. Like, why, why are you surprised that I know something about, like, it's about something, right? You don't ask your friends in your fancy private school where it's just known that you know, right, who Stravinsky is and all these folks, right? So why, why does it come into a question? Why it becomes a question when, when I know it? And that kind of took him aback. He was like, ooh, I never thought of that before. But then he was like, you know, you're, you know I'm not racist, right? I was just like, mm, I don't know, are you not? But this is the kind of stuff that I hear in my village, like directed at uh, unintentionally, right? And I see the ways that students react to it. Like, for real? Like, who did you think I was, okay? Um, yeah, that's that that's what I meant by that whole thing that I said. It's just like I had to be, I had to not flip out, right? See, that's a um, you know, that's a uh, uh, that's a mark of your racist past, and I knew that this wasn't gonna work out, right? And that's dead. So, but it takes a lot of patience though. But it also goes both ways, you know. How many black folks give white folks a hard time when they slip up and just say, see. See, that's what I'm talking about. There's, there's no, there's no way back from that though. If we keep going that way, how do we? You know, I might take some flack from some folks for saying that, but it's true. It's true. 
you know, but it all, it's always like, uh, I can see how those folks feel too. Cause it's like, how come we always have to give the leeway? We're the ones that have to be understanding. We're the ones that have to give the latitude. That's difficult. It's all that. So focus on the relationships that you build. Be careful with the conversations that you have. More importantly, be pay attention to the conversations that you don't have that you know are there. All right, Mr. All right, thank you for the the succinct and the uh, and the elaborate there. Beautiful, um, Matt. I I would like your final thoughts, but I this is a a really important question that that Rebecca poses. Uh, I'd like you to answer that and then give us your final thoughts if you can succinctly as you can in the next three minutes. Um, how can we white educators? find space to process this stuff. So you have someone who recognizes such as yourself, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm somebody that has, uh, I, I am a benefactor of white privilege and on. Where can, where can people go to help get themselves to where they can get to an anti-racist mindset? Yeah, I, I think it's really on the individual to like take the step, right? Like part of that question is an assumption that it's hard or inaccessible to learn about race and whiteness and power where it's like when COVID hit 80% of people learned how to make sourdough bread but we can't understand how race works like it's not that hard like there's endless books there's endless podcasts there's endless movies that could do it so I really think we need to and I have the freedom to say this as a white man, I'm exercising my privilege is like not, I don't think we need to be as lenient. Like there needs to be some accountability and ownership and it's not that hard to learn. Um, especially if you're a person who keeps falling into, fall, stepping into the hole and being called out. If you've been called a racist enough times, like you should do some research and learn about maybe why, right? Um, if we were to go to a doctor and get a, diagnosis, we wouldn't like go home and not read about it, right? Um, but I think, so then what does it need to be? White people need to build spaces like this. Um, it needs to be more normal and just part of everyday practice of being a teacher, particularly a white teacher in Baltimore, particularly a white teacher from outside of the city in Baltimore, right? Like all of these elements, um, it needs to become more normal practice that we just are having conversations. If we're talking, thinking about race as a norm, then the incidents will reduce. And then when they do, we'll have the, the muscle memory and the language to have conversations about it. So it just has to be a more normal, centered part of an everyday in a school. Thank you, Mr. Cipollone. Any, any final thoughts? You were answering a direct question or anything you would give and leave? No, I, I think that's it, I think particularly just thinking about myself, like it needs to be endless work, right? Um, speaking about the history, we can't undo the past 400 years, right? Um, so it needs to be because of that, we live in the present. So we need to understand our racial identities and do the constant work. Um, there's no finish line where I'm like, oh, I finally read enough. Now I'm an anti-racist and I never have to worry about it again. Like from moment to moment, conversation to conversation, I'm either supporting anti-racism or I'm supporting racism. There's no like middle ground. Uh, so all of us need to do this work, particularly white people obviously need to do this work and we need white people to bring other white people along. Thank you, Mr. Cipollone. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. It's been a powerful hour, if I may say so myself. Uh, Ms. Yaja, Michael um, and Miss Gaines, thank you all. I wanted to call you all by name because you appeared by name. Thank you all for joining us today. Again, we are praying for uh, our brother Tyrone. And we do want you to join us Thursday at Tyrone's house, very same link. And if Tyrone's not in the house, I will be leading the conversation. I know that uh, it's always funny when I'm leading his show. Uh, nevertheless, please join us. Thank you all, stay safe. Um, and again, to our esteemed guests who are doing this, this uh, work that's fabulous, but, but not lauded. Thank you, gentlemen, so much. And we'll see you all next Monday.